Welcome to the Enchanting Lawyer podcast. This is Jacob Sapochnik, and I'm um, very excited to have a very, very special guest today, uh, Loris Libert. Loris is um, um, an amazing entrepreneur from Latvia. He's uh, had several, several companies over there. In fact, um, uh, one of his biggest companies, um, uh, Drogium, is the um, uh, Facebook competitor in, uh, in Europe, still the most dominant competitor to Facebook in Europe, to even today. Um, recently, he moved to the U.S., he continues to excel in business and startups. And Loris, welcome to our, to our show. How are you today? Thank you. I'm good. Thank you very much for having me. Very good, Loris. And, you know, I wanted to, um, maybe you could tell us a bit about you. I mean, I, I gave a small intro, but um, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself um, and a bit about your journey before you came to the U.S.? So, um, as you mentioned, uh, we still have uh, a social network back in Latvia, but uh, to be more precise, we're not the dominant player in Europe, but in a country called Latvia. Latvia. And uh, we started a social network called Draugium, which in English means for, uh, for friends, uh, exactly 10 years ago. Actually, we started almost the same month as Facebook was started, and we had a very, very similar concept using real names, last names, news feed, and, and apps, and, uh, and uh, we are still one of the few countries in the world that has not been taken over by Facebook. Uh, the other countries are Russia, China, uh, these enormous gen genetic uh, countries uh, that are um, regulated and, and uh, where Facebook is not allowed to operate. So uh, we started 10 years ago, and uh, out of Jogim, uh, we grew into other businesses. And, uh, and a couple of years ago, um, I felt like uh, we've accomplished uh, what we could in, 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 in Latvia, because it's a very small market. It's only 2 million people, and uh, I, uh, I was still young, and I thought that I would have um, more options, more chances. Uh, if I went abroad. So um, we moved to U.S. three and a half years ago, and uh, even though we had a couple ideas, um, they did not work out, but on this, on this journey here in U.S., we found some other businesses that are uh, picking up and, uh, and doing great. Right. right. And, Lawrence, I, I was reading somewhere that you, um, uh, you, you actually visited the U.S. Um, years before you started uh, uh, the company in, uh, in, in Latvia, and you were visiting as a tourist, and, and, and that's where you had actually the bug for, for startups. You somehow, tell us about what happened when you came back to Latvia after visiting in the U.S. in the late 90s, I believe. Yeah, in the late 90s, I, um, I was a part of the program, which is called uh, Work and Travel USA, and um, I worked in New York City. Um, I was a busboy. Uh, which means I was clearing the tables, and then I was promoted to be a waiter. And um, in New York, I was for um, almost six months, and uh, that was '99. And '99 was the bubble years of internet, right. and all the papers, all the TVs were um, were showing uh, very successful uh, e-commerce and e-business entrepreneurs. And that's where I got the idea that I should go back to Latvia and start something doing online. Right. Even though I had a very, very vague idea of what it actually means. And um, I went back in 99, and in 2000, when I was 23 years old, I, uh, I started my first online business. So now I'm 37, and it took me uh, this... I've been in, to, in online business for 15 years, so uh, wow. I'm, I'm a veteran. And uh, considering that Internet is only, what, 20 years old, so right. I'd say... Three three fourths of the of of the age of internet, I have been into this business, and um, yeah, that's where I got the bug, and uh, <clears throat> and the first ideas were basically copying um, the uh, business ideas that are working here in U.S. and I brought them back to Latvia, right. and uh, my first business idea was actually there's a company called Landing Tree, mm -hmm. which still operates, and and. And the idea is you submit one um, loan application that gets sent to multiple lenders, and then right. they compete for your business, uh, for your uh, loan. And uh, that's what I did back in Latvia. Um, right. Right. It was a very, very tiny business, but uh, nevertheless, it gave me some uh, very um, important lessons of um, starting, of uh, having the business model, of finding the partners, and, and, 
and getting the customers. So, yeah, right. nothing right. has changed. In it, you know, one of the things that I find interesting about you is that um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you don't have a technical background. You're not a you're not a computer engineer, right? No, I'm not. I'm not you're a not. techie. You're not. No, I'm not. I'm, uh, and um, <clears throat> I wish I was, but I I I've, I've given it a try, and. Um, my mind just does not work like that. And uh, my business partner, he's a techie, so he can help me out. But uh, obviously, I, I do know the buzzwords of, of uh, the most important technologies that are used in, in building uh, e-commerce businesses. But no, I can't program. And uh, I've long given up uh, doing that. And uh, that's how I um, live without it. Right, and, and the reason I'm asking that is because I think that there is an advantage to not being the, the technical guy because you see the vision and you have the people who are good at it execute the vision. Um, I, would not, I, would, I wouldn't call it uh, to, that it's, it's an advantage. I would call um, that I, I've, uh, I have adapted to it. Right. But uh, I wish I was more a technical person because... Um, then you can really know when, when, when you're talking to tech people um, that they are not exaggerating things right. or guide them or, or help pick the uh, most, uh, the better technologies, how to build your service. Um, I mean, I wish I was smarter in this, but well, that's life. Right, I mean, right. that's, that's actually being part of an entrepreneur because you are never perfect. You, right. you might not you you might not know finance part you might not know the law side and you might not you might not be the uh, techie but uh, when you adapt and you know your strengths and weaknesses then uh, then uh, you can pursue your right. goals right your, your job is to bring everything together you are the glue that's really yeah. key and the passion i always tell that uh, I don't have to be the smartest in a room, and, and I like to hire people who are a lot smarter than me. Right. And my job is just putting them into one room and, and, and getting so, something out of it. Right. And you know, Loris, you mentioned uh, somewhere that um, you know, people look at you and the success you, you gain in life and they think, oh, it's, it came to him so easy. But you, you mentioned that you had more than 10 companies that failed or businesses that you tried that didn't, that didn't make it. Tell me a bit more about those failures and, and what, what you learned from that. Um, there are a lot of failures and, and, and obviously they don't get advertised. And, uh, and um, when we came to U.S., for example, uh, we had, um, I ran my first marathon and, uh, and uh, we came up with this idea for uh, um, crowdsourced sports photography. Mm -hmm. For example, when you finish a marathon and after, uh, after the finish, you get sent links to your photos that have been taken by professional uh, photograph uh, photographers and those photos are usually pretty expensive. In my case, it was like uh, four photos that would cost me $90 and I thought, no, there must be a better way. And uh, so we created this crowdsourced sports photography website where anyone on the sides of the uh, race could take photos of athletes, could uh, tag the uh, bib numbers in the photos. Right. That set the price and upload to the website and me as an athlete would go to the website type in my uh, bib number 96 and find the photos that have been uploaded by people from the sites and even though we had um, we had uh, photographers even though we had events and 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 the prices were much lower um, in the end it did not work out because just a very small percentage of all the people who had the photos actually bought them. So, so we had a great idea. We uh, launched it, but uh, the business model just did not work out. And um, and the thing is, I don't look as at failures as failures because I don't uh, I don't blame myself. I uh, don't want to kill myself. It's just a stepping stone um, into a direction where I learn stuff that. Uh, it just did not work out, and I move on to the next project. And right. uh, and um, I know that there's this stigma in the world that what happens when I fail, I might be ashamed for my parents, for my friends. It never happens with me. I always go with the mind that uh, 
it might work and it might not. I never know which way it's going to go. So I just try it out. Right. Unless so, you try, you never know. Right. So you're not in the opinion that you should do all these surveys and do the research, whether it's, there's a demand. You just you, you feel that it may work, you try it. If it doesn't work, it didn't work. Exactly. And, uh, and, um, and my projects, uh, the way I build them is um, I, don't, uh, I don't make um, a project for a year and then put on a market. I usually make something within two months, maybe one month, put it out and see what the reaction is. And it might not yeah. be perfect, but you can always tell if, it, if it's going to work or not from the very, very first um, customer uh, feedback that you might receive. And uh, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, just putting on in the market and getting the feedback. That's my motto. Right. It's better than trying to get all these guesses and then you waste all this time trying to do surveys and maybe at the end of the day somebody can just take it to heart and like it despite yeah. all the comments. Well, well, uh, well I think Steve Jobs uh, said that uh, if, you, uh, if you ask people uh, or Henry Ford, if you ask people what do they want to have, they would say I want to have a faster horse instead of a car. <laughs> so right. people don't know really what they want unless you give them a product they might, that, they may, that they might actually use. So right. Uh, right. yeah, I don't believe in surveys and I believe in real products in real life with real customers and that's how uh, you can um, tell the market needs. Very good. This is, this is great advice. You know, before we talk about your uh, the company in the U.S. that you do, I wanted to ask you, uh, as somebody who's coming from from Europe, from overseas, to start in the U.S., what do you think is the the main differences between setting up a company in Europe, in Latvia, in this in this case, as opposed to um, the culture here for startups? Well, uh, Latvia is a pretty uh, easy uh, is a, is a place where you can uh, establish your company pretty easy. Just like here in the U.S., all it takes is a lawyer, in, or maybe you can do it without it. I'm not sure, but uh, either way, it's it's not very complicated, and and, and having um, a legal entity is the easiest part. The hardest part is coming up with uh, with a business model or a business that you want to pursue, and uh, and uh, especially online, there. Are millions millions of people out there in the world and uh, even though you might establish company here in the US you might be actually competing with people from from India from Philippines from uh, from Australia so identifying your uh, your niche identifying your uh, your direction where you want to go and establish business i think that's the hardest part right and i i think what i was trying to um to find, and I, we have, I have a lot of questions from people who are who know that I deal with foreign uh, companies. Say, what do you think is their biggest secret to succeeding overseas and then coming over here and trying to um, take it to the next level? Because I think that the question is: Is there support from the community over there for a new business, for a new startup? Is there, um, as opposed to here in, in the U.S., is such a big market? Uh, anything new that comes up, there's all this viral, little viral uh, effect. Is, do you have the same support over there in, in Latvia? Um, yeah, well, uh, Latvia is very small, first right. of all. It's two million people, and, and, and creating a business in two million, mar Four. Two million, billion, million uh, people market is, is pretty hard. Right. Coming to the U.S., uh, you, first of all, you have 320 million something people, and, and, and second, when you operate in the U.S., you're basically operating on a global scale, so you're right. talking already about billions. Cause all the big companies, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, even though they might be only in English, uh, right. and have users all over the world. But uh, true, coming to U.S., especially the um, L.A. or San Francisco, Silicon Valley, New York or Boston, you might have these very, very large groups of, uh, of um, kind of places where entrepreneurs hang out. And if you want to get a... If you want to get connected, if you want to get inspired, if you want to get um, have connections, get going, then uh, then yeah, you just reach out, to meetups, and and all these events. You might actually go to events every night if you want to, and uh, and and that's that's very crucial, if, right. especially at the very very first stage when you when you have just come and you want to get a sense of what's really going on. 
you got to go out and, and hang out with those people and see what they think, what they're working on, and then you might find where to fit in or maybe um, join for, uh, join uh, join with another um, founder or, 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 or come up with something with, uh, unique, especially if you, when you come from, from abroad, you might combine something that is uh, from your uh, native country and something from the U.S. And, and, and when you create these combinations, then something interesting might come out. And besides, um, I might be wrong, but I think that uh, um, I read somewhere that in Silicon Valley or maybe in U.S., uh, right. The fifty uh, percent of all the founders have come outside of U.S. Um, I think it's for right. Fortune five hundred companies or something. So, right. so that gives a sense that when you come here, there is something that you bring along, and right. uh, and that might be the differentiator uh, from you and from the people who are working here, because because it's all about combining unique things when you're creating right. your startup. And people so, saying that um, your creativity that you bring from abroad is amplified in the U.S. because you have all these opportunities here, and you yeah. become the driver of your own uh, of your own yeah. success. And Americans love accents. That I didn't know. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. I heard Americans that too. Accents. And, we, and, we both have strong accents, so I think that uh, that yeah. gives us an advantage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, Laura, I. Um, you know, as, as, as we talked before, you know that I'm, I'm pretty active on Facebook and Facebook has really been my uh, passion. And, and when I told some of the Facebook marketers that I'm going to talk to you and, and, and about you, who you are, they were very excited about it because they said that, well, you know, we can't talk to Mark Zuckerberg, but Lawrence is probably the next best thing. And the question is, when you started your, your company, Drogium, in 2004, there is nothing like Facebook or nothing like that. The concept of people are um, always on and, and connecting and sharing and, and updating. I want, I want to get into your mind for 2004 and what brought you the idea to create something like that. Because before that, we didn't really have anything. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean in, in MySpace wasn't the same. It wasn't the same idea. It, was, it, it had some, some of that. But 2000, sorry. So I get the question. Thank you. In 2004, there was a website called Friendster. Correct. I remember Friendster. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and Friendster was big at the time, but mm -hmm. uh, they failed technically. Right. Because uh, they had these um, uh, connected links to your friends of friends of friends, and they tried to show the whole path, and their website was, was very, very slow. Right. And uh, reading later, uh, they had very um, severe inter internal problems, operational problems. Mm -hmm. That's the reason they might have failed. But the reason I started Drogging was uh, I had a very small shirt company. And I was selling about five t-shirts a day. And um, the only goal for me was um, to build something that would advertise my shirt website so I could sell more shirts. So, uh, and uh, when I was building this social network, my, my, my idea was I have this website. I didn't know what a virality is, mm -hmm. but I hoped that I would have 10,000 people. I would put up uh, ads of uh, my t shirt website, mm -hmm. and instead of five shirts, I would be selling maybe 20 shirts. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that was my only goal because I wow. didn't have any money for advertising, and that's how I built it. And, uh, and uh, there was also uh, websites like Classmates. Mm -hmm. and in Latvia, there was a website that uh, did just uh, the same. And, uh, and, and uh, you could see from, from the virality of people inviting their classmates to join the website. And uh, there was this sense of uh, that internet has changed because people are becoming uh, uh, connected. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I just happened to be at the right time. Um, uh, riding the wave. So what happened when you launched it? You, you know, your idea was to sell the t-shirts. How did you promote it in the beginning? Because I have to promote it. Uh, when we started out, we invited our friends and mm -hmm. um, in the first day we had a, you know, 100 users. On the second day, there were 800 users and, and from then on it just uh, snowballed. And, um, and uh, frankly, for the first three years, we could not keep up with traffic. Uh, there were so many people coming in, and and just like uh, Friendster, we had uh, major problems with showing the whole path of how you know each uh, person on 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 a website, and uh, and uh, we were struggling a lot. But uh, we survived, and 
there were coming competitors, local and foreign, popping up like High Five and 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 the local ones that were when we were very slow or or or, or out of service. I thought that this is it; they're taking us over. But right. somehow we survived. And what was your what was your revenue model over the years? Was it purely advertising or? Um, so the thing is, in uh, 2004, um, I didn't know what a VC money is, and uh, and uh, we had to find ways of how to um, sustain ourselves. And uh, after three months of launching, uh, we launched a service called Profile Statistics. Mm -hmm. Basically, gives you, uh, uh, which basically uh, helps you to see people who visit your profile. And in order to see those people, you had to pay, and uh, and uh, it costs very cheap, and it still costs very cheap. It's about um, um, it's about uh, seventy dollars cents, fifty euro cents, and we've got we've kept this number um, almost unchanged for the whole ten years. And uh, but when you add when 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 you have a couple of hundred thousand people buying the service, it gives you. A very good, um, very good uh, revenue, and and it basically saved us uh, and helped us uh, grow. Right. Later on, we added a couple more services, and advertising is a big deal. But but uh, yeah, so games, the little added services, and 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 advertising is the th three models that uh, work for us right now. Excellent. And it's interesting that you mentioned the tracking of profiles because Facebook refuse to do that uh, option and even today they're refusing to do that and there are different reasons they you know some people say for privacy people they want to you know create a um, an assumption of privacy but you felt that that was really something people wanted and they still want it today to know who's actually looking at it kind of like LinkedIn LinkedIn you know who's uh, who can you know who's, who viewed your profile or something. Yeah, on LinkedIn you have kind of vague idea who visited. vague idea yeah yeah, yeah. but uh, on our website you can actually see the faces of people and I think this little service has actually helped us to survive this far because right. this is the service that differentiates us from Facebook and mm -hmm. us because all the other things are pretty similar but the profile statistics is something that we, uh, that we, uh, that, 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 uh, we have and they don't. And, right. uh, and, um, and it is a great business model for us and it works and people by nature are very curious and uh, and they come and, and see that and as long as they they will be uh, curious and as long as they're paying that um, we will be fighting with Facebook absolutely and then you know I, I read somewhere that Facebook is is they, they'll be changing their their view uh, or and the model in the next few years they're going to become more of a it's going to become a platform for information as opposed to become social that's why a lot of people are leaving that that platform and you you what is your vision of you, of the European company um, Socially yeah. wise. So yeah, so uh, so uh, the whole uh, landscape uh, has changed, and uh, and um, friending your friends is a little bit outdated. And uh, then came uh, Instagram and 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 Twitter, where you could follow people whoever you want to. Right. And then came uh, WhatsApp, where you where your social network is your address book on on your phone. So um, we might be moving into that direction as well. We might be moving away from friending to something different that is uh, that is more closer, maybe to WhatsApp, WhatsApp or or Instagram. So uh, so yeah, I mean, um, I don't I don't really know where the market might be in ten years, but uh, I know that for sure that we have to change along with it. And uh, so far. We have kind of uh, successfully did that, right? So the key is kind of to adapt because a lot of the young young uh, users they want it immediate. They want like you know, the Snapchat has changed the the, the the scenery because they just want an immediate an immediate connection. Uh, I don't know how it can survive um, in the future, but it's just been such a crazy development. I know, and uh, and Snapchat, um, that is the service that was built basically by teens for teens. And right. uh, even though I don't regard myself as an old person, I feel like I am falling away from from the new trends. And uh, 
And um, as, uh, as uh, the CEO, as a person in charge, that is my task to have these young people around me right. where right. I could see what their trends are, what they're doing online, and, and um, you have to adapt. But uh, yeah, internet is, uh, is a young man's um, land. And, Absolutely. Uh, and you know, Lars, it's funny that you mention it because I think it's the same way that Mark Zuckerberg is doing. I mean, I, I was in Facebook in the campus. I was fortunate enough to be invited in, in January, and I was there for half a day. And I can tell you that I felt very old. The whole place looks like high school. There's so many young kids there, and there's a lot of creativity. They sit, they do whatever they want, and they create ideas. And I think that's, that's really the key. I mean, you can't create your, your team and say, you know what, we don't care. You live with the new generation. Exactly. I'm with you. But uh, on the other hand, there must be someone also who would be building services for us, like middle-aged people. Sure, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that might be our option. Right, right. And, then, and that brings me, uh, I want to bring you now to the U.S. So, you know, you came to the U.S. And, and the funny thing is that instead of starting a, a, a social or, or internet company, you go back to basics and you do a product company. What, what gave you the idea to do like, I'm talking about Startup Vitamins right now. If you want to tell us a bit more about so, that company. So, so uh, when, when, when we first came to U.S., we, um, my wife and me came with student visas. Even though we can travel without visa, we just wanted to make sure that we might stay maybe longer if we like it here. So we came, uh, we explored, and, 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 and we decided, okay, this is a pretty good place uh, to hang out and to build business. So after English school, after three months, uh, we went back as I went back as a, as a tourist, and I started exploring even more. I joined the local um, uh, Kolak, which is co-working space, and it, it, I met some cool entrepreneurs. And 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 again, I I got the confidence that I might be actually living here and working here. And um, finally, after three months, so in total that was like six months in total in the U.S. Uh, we went back to Latvia and uh, we applied for investor visa and um, they gave us for two years and the investor visa allows you to work and live but you have to have but you have to prove that you can make a business within two years so that's kind of a deadline where you have to have a real business you have to have local uh, people that you have hired and uh, and uh, in these two years I had to make it happen and uh, if I were to build a website that would just chat or, or without a business model or anything very vague, then, uh, then I would fail and I would not be able to extend my visa. So I had to build something that is very, um, very real with real money and with real business model. And, uh, and um, I know the trend is, okay, I'm going to create my, my product and once I have the people then I'll figure out how to make money. That was not the case for me. I have to figure it out from day one. Right. And, uh, and yeah, so uh, since I've been um, addicted to uh, entrepreneurship and, and all business um, and I, had a, I have um, a very cool office back in Latvia and I was looking for um, posters to put on walls, I really couldn't find anything. So that's where we came up with Star Vitamins. And we started uh, printing here in the house with my wife, and uh, and it just took off. And um, before, um, and when we started out, Star Vitamins already knew that there must be a website where you could outsource all that. But there wasn't a single website where we could tell, hey, um, I want to pr I want to outsource T-shirt printing, poster printing, uh, canvas printing, etc. So from day second, I already knew, okay, I'm going to start out with Star Vitamins, but later on, I'm going to move into Printful and build businesses so other printing com so other um, companies might actually use the back end uh, of, of of Printful and uh, that's how we uh, started out. Wow! So that was kind of like a necessity. It was a necessity. Yeah. Exactly. All yeah. my businesses start out as my personal necessities. Yeah. Sports snaps for the sports photos. My own necessity. Draugiem, 10 years ago, my own necessity. So Printful, right. again, I wish there was a service when I was starting out with Star Vitamins. Yeah. Right. And, you, you know, you're, you're one of your, show me one of your most popular uh, products. The, oh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, the cup. Yeah. yeah. Right. Very good. Yeah. We'll, we'll put a link. I'll put a link to that image at the end of our, you know, people like that. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, it has helped us a lot. Uh, it was featured initially on fancy website. Mm -hmm. uh, Fancy.com and 
and uh, and uh, a lot of famous people have uh, put up on uh, put it out on Instagram, and it helped us for awareness and for for virality a lot. Who comes up with the creative uh, slogans and ideas for for your for the startup vitamins? Uh, the slogans that are on Star Vitamins, mm -hmm. I usually pick them out and uh, I find them just reading magazines and books and, and blogs and uh, and you just read a blog and you come up across something that just encapsulates the whole meaning of the blog. You just take it out and, and put, make it as a poster. So this, most of these words, they're not, nobody else is using them. You don't have, you get permission or copyright. It's just your, your interpretation of what you read. Uh, it's not my interpretation, uh, but it's in public domain. It is, okay. They're not copyrighted, then uh, we're free to use and we give credit to the authors. So uh, when you go to Star Vitamins, you can see who the author is. And, okay. uh, and uh, there was a case for one uh, slogan that we had to take down because of copyright issues. But uh, yeah, we try to, we, we're using only uh, quotes that are in public domain. Right. And so tell me uh, some of the companies that are actually using it now, uh, your posters, some big names. Oh, um, all the major companies. Um, the same Facebook and, and, and Google and Twitter and Nike. And uh, we've sent out um, tens of wow. thousands all across the world. And uh, we're, sent, we're shipping to every country, everywhere. It's, right. it's very, very global. It's a niche market, but a very, very global one. It's, you know, it's, I, I read a, an article about the founders of Life is Good, and they're basically saying the same thing. You know, it's, it, what makes people feel good, this, you know, the having, wearing something that is positive yeah. is really uh, is just changing. Uh, people just love it. Yeah. So, yeah. so the motto for Star Vitamins is uh, to motivate and to educate. Right. So some of the posters are very, very educational. Like, right. Like the longer it takes to develop something, the less likely it is to launch. And uh, by Jason Fried, and, uh, right. and that's very true. I've seen entrepreneurs who are building their product for a year and two years, and they have not launched. And uh, when I look at them, I know subconsciously that they might actually that they might not actually launch it ever. Right. No, it's it's. I mean, I, I love some of those stuff. I mean, I, I'm, I, need to, I need to order myself a couple of these T-shirts. And, Lawrence, as we come to the end of our uh, show, uh, why don't you uh, share with us uh, maybe a book that inspires you or that you, wanna, you feel that people should, uh, should read that, that you like? Well, um, I've, I've, uh, I have actually a pretty big selection of business books, but the one book that stands out, and I have not reread it, but I, I read it 10 years ago, and it's called Blue Ocean Strategy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the book basically is about that... Um, um, there are these um, markets that have been dominated by very powerful companies and they might be actually uh, very innovative and strong and uh, for example Facebook and if you were to build out a service that would be basically copying Facebook you would be entering a red ocean but you always have to find um, a market that is called the blue ocean that would set you apart where you would have less competition and where you could strive. And uh, when I build the services, I never go against well-established or strong or, 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 or innovative companies that I feel like they're dominating. I always right. try to find an angle where they're not working, where, they, where I might have an option. And, uh, and Printful, even though it is kind of boring industry, like printing. And, and I hear people saying, hey, what's so special about printing? But when you try to print um, for uh, hundreds of companies simultaneously and hundreds of different uh, products in basically one, uh, one of uh, exam, I'm not sure the word. So when, when, you, when you're trying, uh, when you print in one off, uh, mm. then, then, then it becomes uh, pretty complicated. So, so we kind of took an old industry that is, uh, that is boring and we put it a twist with the technology and then and I feel like we have we have found a great niche uh, that is a couple billion dollar large in U.S. alone, and uh, and uh, that is my blue ocean. Right, perfect. So one advice that you can give to a new startup or somebody who's coming—it doesn't have to be overseas, but you know, starting out today in 2014 to be successful, what would it be? Um, 
my my motto is uh, just to give it a try. Most of the people have some kind of ideas, but the trouble is they never try. They never they never actually commit to doing something and finishing it. Right. So if you have even the worst idea, if you do something with it, first of all, you will learn. And second of all, you will set apart for, uh, from, from your peers that you have actually find, uh, have launched something and finished something. And, uh, and, uh, and business is all about journey. When I came to US, I did not know that I will start Star Vitamins or I will start Printful. But you start somewhere and then the road winds up somewhere where you did not expect it to go. And right. uh, so I would say just start doing and then and uh, finishing your products and launching to the world. Excellent, great advice. And Loris, if people want to find you, uh, why don't you give us the uh, where you are online, Startup Vitamins and uh, any other? Yeah. So, uh, so I am on Twitter, um, Twitter, um, Lauris Libert, and, uh, and uh, they can email me, libert at gmail.com. And um, yeah, all the websites are online, the Printful and Draw Game Group. So, uh, um, you said that you're going to post up some links. We will. So. We'll put all the links up there. Very good. Thank you so much, uh, Loris, for coming on the show. And uh, this is Jacob Saposhnik at EnchantingLawyer.com. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, email me, Jacob at EnchantingLawyer.com. Any comments or suggestions? Thank you for listening.